today. We welcome uh, Rebecca Snell. Uh, she's a, a professor in environmental and plant biology, and she's going to talk to us about uh, forest responding to climate change. Thank you. Is this on? I don't think this is on. Is it on? Oh, ish? Okay. Oh, there. I think there we go. Okay, thank you so much, and thank you for everyone who, come, who came out tonight. Um, I'm really excited to be here and talk about um, forests and climate change um, and some of the stuff that I do for my research here at OU. Um, so if this is a graph that is not familiar to you, um, what you're looking at here, this is something called warming stripes, or show your stripes. Um, and this is global mean annual temperature for every year from 1850 starts over here at 1850, and every year is a stripe, and we end up here at 2018. And they're colored to represent how far away they are from sort of what we consider like a baseline climate, which is about in the 60s and 70s back here. So these colors are pretty light and cooler than average um, temperatures are blue or brighter blue, and then the darker reds are warmer. And I like to start with this because sometimes I think we talk about climate change as something that's going to happen, but the reality is climate change is actually already happening. So this is the last 20 years, 25 years or so, and so consistently for the last 25 years, we're seeing warmer than average temperatures at a global level. So climate change is already happening. This isn't something that's going to happen. This is something that is currently our new normal. And if you're curious, that graph only ended in 2018. If you're curious about 2019, so 2019 was the second warmest year. So 2016 is still the warmest year. That's, um, but 2019 was the second. And if you look, our last five years have all been the warmest years. So again, this is just to sort of highlight that climate change, we're already there, right? So on average, we're about one to 1.25 degrees Celsius above normal. And if you look into the future, so this is now looking into these sort of future projections, and this is just one of those metrics for climate change. There's lots of different ones. This is one of them, and this is the number of days above height um, in one year. And so again, this is kind of our baseline. So in, on average, in the past, most of us would basically have less than 10 days that would be above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, with the exception of some places in California and, and Texas. This is the projection for the end of the century. So pretty much we're seeing a huge increase across all of the US in the number of days that are gonna hit 100 degrees Fahrenheit over a year. I mean, in certain parts of the US, it's gonna be more than 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry, more than, a, more than 100 degrees Fahrenheit for more than 120 days. So that's basically about a third of the year. So one third of the year is gonna be over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Even here in Ohio, right, so we're pretty far north and our climate's pretty mild. Even here in Ohio, the projections are showing anywhere from 20 to 30 days a year that are gonna be more than 100 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a big change from where we used to be, right? And so there's, you can imagine how this is gonna impact pretty much all facets of our life, right? So there's health concerns here, there's infrastructure, um, sea level rise, agriculture, um, and forests, and that's my, the piece of it that I'm really interested in is how is this you know, going to affect forests and what forests do for us, but just to recognize that this really is going to impact most of our lives. Okay, so why are forests important? So why do we care about forests? Why are we here? And I'm going to open it up. You. Hands up. Why do you like forests? Yeah. Um, well, they give us oxygen. Yep, definitely. That's right, so what plants do is they take in carbon dioxide, right, and then they let out oxygen, right? So we call that carbon sequestration because they're taking in carbon and they're letting out oxygen, so they're really important. Yep. You can get exercise by taking a nice walk. That's an awesome idea, yeah, absolutely. Going hiking in a forest is a perfect way to get exercise and to go outside and do something active. Why else do we like forests? Mm-hmm. Oh, do I change the switch? Yeah, the mic's going weird. Okay. No problem. Okay. Okay, so the other suggestion was that um, 
forests are really important because they actually mitigate climate and they actually cool down um, surface area. So they're helpful for basically also mitigating local climate. Anyone else? Bird habitat, forest species are fantastic habitats for all sorts of wildlife, birds included. Soil erosion, they prevent soil erosion, right? So without forests, and this is particularly true here in Southeast Ohio, without our forests, basically the soils just basically blow away after all that open pit mining. Yep. They are a renewable resource, right? So what do we take out of our forests? What's the resource? Lumber, yeah, absolutely. If we manage them right, we can continue to get lumber out of our forests, right? All right, so the framework that I use for my research is what's called ecosystem goods and services. Um, and this tries to basically quantify all the things that you are saying. So what do forests do for us? And we try to put it into a framework so we can actually quantify it, right? And we typically talk about four different areas for these ecosystem services. We call them provisioning, regulating, supporting, and cultural services. So, Provisioning services are the easiest to understand. This is literally what you take out of the forest, right? So they're commodities, things we take out. And so, like we said, this is lumber, right? This is mushrooms. People go mushroom hunting. This is medicinal herbs. So we have lots of medicinal plants. Um, if you hunt, right? This is the, the wildlife, the wild game that you hunt out of the forest. So these are the things that the forest is providing for you for free, basically. Regulating services are the things that the forests do for you, for free, but if they weren't doing for you, we would have to do. So regulating services are things that if the forest isn't doing, we have to do. So the cost of regulating services only shows up when the forest stops doing what it's supposed to do. So these are things like carbon sequestration, so taking carbon in, right, and mitigating climate and weather control. Pest and pathogen control, water and air purification, so these are the things that healthy forest ecosystems do for us for free. And the cost of these is basically when they no longer work. So there's a really famous case in New York City um, in the 80s. They needed um, to build a new water filtration plant because they needed more water, more clean water. And the cost to build a water treatment facility was going to be between eight to $10 billion plus about $100 million a year to run it every year. Now the cost to restore the watershed, so it was a forested watershed just north of New York City, was $1 billion. And after they restored it, it was gonna continue to work and do this for free. So what do you think they did? Water treatment facility plant. Restore the forest. Yeah, it makes sense money-wise too, right? So it was much cheaper to restore the forest. They've done this, and New York City has the largest unfiltered water supply system in the US. This is also the reason why people think that New York bagels taste better and New York pizza, so they say. Because the water that they use is delicious and it's unfiltered, there's no chemicals in it. And the treatment, basically the, the forest is doing that for free, right? Supporting services we don't usually talk about, but these are the things that a healthy ecosystem has to do in order for everything else to work. So these are things like habitat, so providing habitat, um, supporting genetic diversity, um, soil formation, so these are the things that we want our healthy ecosystems to do, um, but we don't usually quantify those, or they're harder to quantify. And then cultural values. So these are things that, these are our human values. These are things we value in an ecosystem. So this is things like spiritual connections, the fact that forests are beautiful. We aesthetically, they're very pleasing. We like to go hiking in them, right? We like to go cycling in them. All of these things are things that we value as humans um, that the forest is providing for us, again, for free. Right? So the question when we think about forests, or when I think about forests, is under climate change, what changes? So are they still providing all of these services for us, or are things shifting? So the way that I look at this, so bear with me, as you can imagine on this side, we have some sort of ecosystem property or ecosystem service. So imagine that's carbon sequestration or timber, whatever you want. And over time, our forest is providing this to us, right? And then something happens, right? We don't know it. We can imagine it's climate change. And that service basically goes down, right? So over time, that service is going to decrease. Or maybe nothing happens. Maybe our forests don't change. Something happens under climate change, and maybe our forests continue to truck along. 
So we call that resistance. This is ecological resistance, not to be confused with engineering resistance, if any of you are engineers. So ecological resistance is this change in a forest property in response to some sort of event. So the forest on the top would be considered very resistant. Nothing happened, really. And the forest on the bottom would be not very resistant. It basically crashed. Now, after the event, we certainly hope our forest comes back, right? So you imagine this is some sort of disturbance, right? Our forest is going to recover. And this is called resilience. So this is the ability of your forest or your ecosystem to come back after an event. So in this case, we would have a very resilient forest. It wasn't very resistant, but it was very resilient. Or maybe it's not so resilient. So something happens, it crashes, and it never comes back, right? So, this, so just keep this in mind, because we're going to work with this framework later, OK? Because in an ideal world, we want forests that are both resistant and resilient, right? OK, so we're going to start with the most sensational of the climate change impacts on forests, which are disturbances. OK, so specifically fire and insect outbreaks. Both have links to climate change. Um, and both are going to really impact forests and forest ecosystems. All right, so fire and climate change. So this is, it feels like every year in the news, there's some sort of news article about one part of the world that's burning. Often it's California or basically um, out west in sort of Washington and Idaho states as well. So um, basically there's a real strong link between fire and climate change. So most fires have a lot to do with drought, right? So warmer temperatures, less precipitation, we're gonna get more intense and longer droughts and droughts affect fuel flammability. So if our fuel's really, really dry, then a lightning strike will start a fire, and it'll spread fast, and it'll be a hot burning fire. Right, and so this is just two years. This was 2016, if you remember, was the really terrible year. If you also remember 2016, there were some really huge fires out west, and if you're paying attention, this is as we go through the year, the really intense drought just hangs out here all year. So, this is a totally different year. This is 2011, and the drought was basically way down here in the south. And, but California was basically fine. All right. And this is just a different way to look at it for California. Um, and this is just showing that the five worst fire seasons over here in red are associated with the lowest amount of precipitation over winter and the five basically smallest fire seasons had a lot of winter precipitation. So the concern is going forward also, we're sort of increasing droughts, increasing severity of droughts, and so this, again, we're kind of gonna be sort of on this side of the graph more frequently in the future. The other major forest disturbance is um, pest outbreaks. Um, so these are just four of them, there are more. Um, but I chose all these four because they're all basically stem boring insects. So they all sort of work the same. You can ask me about the details later. But approximately, they all sort of work the same in that the adults lay their eggs on the tree trunk and the eggs basically eat the inner bark of the tree and essentially kill the tree. So they eat the living part of the bark, eating the sugars and the waters. Um, mountain pine beetle and spruce beetle are native, right? So we're having mountain pine beetle outbreaks, but they are native. Um, whereas emerald ash borer and the Asian longhorn beetle are introduced species. And this is what it looks like. So once you get a mountain pine beetle outbreak, this is out west, all of the gray, if you can see it, are dead trees that were killed by mountain pine beetle. So they are really, I mean, they're having a big impact and they're killing lots and lots of trees. All of these trees are also then fuel for fire because they're dead, standing dead trees. And the link between pest outbreaks, and climate change is this. Cold winter temperatures basically kill these insects, right? So this is historically in the past, this is beetle survival. This is the mountain pine beetle. So this is beetle survival in red, and the blue is the minimum winter temperature, right? And so you can see in the past, cold winters kill the beetles, and warm winters, we have a lot of survival of the beetle, right? So in the past, climate regulated the beetle populations. If it was cold in the winter, most of the beetles died. Since 1980, you can see minimum winter temperatures just going up. It's just not getting cold enough anymore. 
And so we're seeing beetle survivorship go up, so they're not being killed. And so that's why we're getting these huge outbreaks. Emerald ash borer is also t limited by cold winter temperatures. This is the map um, showing everywhere where ash is and where emerald ash borer could be. And the only place that's safe from emerald ash borer is up here, and that's because it consistently gets below minus 30 degrees Celsius. And that's the temperature that'll kill them. Everywhere else, it just doesn't get cold enough. And again, with climate change, we can imagine that they're just gonna continue to spread, right? Alrighty, I've spoken enough, so it's time to be a forest. So everyone hopefully has two pieces of paper. So now it's your turn. So we're gonna go with the purpley color, purple white, whatever you wanna call it. Okay, so each one of you is now a tree. If you don't have a piece of paper, you can raise your hand and we have extras that someone can come around and give you a piece of paper. Okay. So you are a beautiful, mature, lodgepole pine forest at West, okay? You're about 120 years old. This is what you look like, really gorgeous. Um, and we're gonna do CO2. We're gonna do basically carbon sequestration as our ecosystem service that we're curious about, okay? Life is good, all right? Fire, right? So fire is a big disturbance that we just talked about. So there's a huge fire that comes along. The forest is burning. What happens? Are you a living or are you dying? Oh. <laughs> Hands up if you're gonna die. Hands up if you think you'll survive. Maybe, maybe we have one or two survivors. This is what it looked like after the fire. This is in Yellowstone in the 1988 fires. And this is what it looked like. So hands up, who survives? Yeah, nobody survives, right? We all die. So basically our our ecosystem property, CO2 provisioning goes just down, it tanks, right? Everyone dies, right? So no, we have no resistance to this. So lodgepole pine has very little resistance to fire. A fire comes through and they will die. Okay, what happens next? Read your cards. The cones open. So lodgepole pine is something called serotonous cones, which basically means these cones are sealed shut, right? And fire melts that. Right? And then the cones open and they release all the seeds. So what do you think your resilience is like? Pretty good. This was 10 years later. So these are 10 year old, 10 year old lodgepole pine seedlings and you can still see the dead ones like standing, but they all came back. And pretty much in a monoculture, they all just you know, were fantastic. The resilience was great, right? So we popped right back up and they're growing really fast. Okay, so resilience is pretty good. 2016, which I keep coming back to. So remember 2016, really hot year, right? Lots of fires. And some of these plots in Yellowstone burned again. So we have another fire. So what happens now? You're 28 years old. So right, so we're, we're certainly gonna die again. We still have no resistance to fire, still dead. What happens to the resilience? Can we come back? Well, what, what does your sheet say? Do you produce cones? Yeah. So at this stage, you're only making what are called open cones. So these are not the serotonous cones. So lodgepole pine is expecting a fire frequency of about 60 to 80 years, right? So that's what it's adapted to. It's adapted to fire, but it's expecting that fire interval to be longer, right? And the problem is with climate change, our fire intervals are getting shorter. So lodgepole pine, which is a fire-adapted species, is not adapted to frequent fires like this. And so we really don't know actually what's gonna happen. Um, so there's some opportunity for seed dispersal from outside, so it might still come back. Aspen is popping up in these places, so we might be seeing some sort of species shift. Um, so this is really something we haven't seen before. So we typically expect lodgepole pine to regenerate itself, but with this sort of more frequent fire, we just don't know. So stay tuned and pay attention and we'll find out what happens. Okay, so those are the big disturbances, like those are the big climate change impacts. And I wanna talk now about what we consider to be kind of these subtle impacts, okay? And these are impacts on species. So this is a direct impact of climate on a species, okay? 
And this is why we expect there to be an impact. So this, for example, is tulip poplar. It's one of my favorite trees. It's here on campus. I really like it because I'm Canadian, and we don't get tulip. I never saw a tulip poplar until I moved here. So I really love it. I think it's a fabulous tree. Um, See, so yeah, I grew up sort of over here. Anyways, and this is the distribution map of tulip poplar, right? And all species have this as some sort of distribution map. And for trees, especially out here in the east, what determines this border is cold climate. So if it's too cold and it can't survive. So that's why we see it. It's really more of a southern species. This border is typically precipitation. As we move this way, typically things just get drier. So we often see some sort of border here for trees about precipitation. So these borders are determined by climate. Here's my other favorite tree, because I'm Canadian. This is sugar maple. We love sugar maple. And you can see sugar maple is a more northern species. It goes much further north, right? So it certainly can tolerate colder temperatures. And it doesn't actually really like the warm climate. Um, and then again, this, this is more of a precipitation gradient. But this is the assumption. If their distributions are determined by climate, and climate is changing, then species should move, right? So if we zoom in, here's sugar maple, right? If climate warms, we expect that northern range to shift, right? So trees should be able to migrate and move in response to warming climate, right? If it's warmer, they should go. So how do trees move? <laughs> Not this way, unfortunately. So we often talk about shifting, an like shifting species, but animals have the advantage of legs or wings, and they can move. How do trees move? Absolutely, so they produce seeds, right? And if they put those seeds inside a nice tasty fruit, an animal will eat that fruit, and it's gonna move it, right? And so, Basically, plants can only move by seed dispersal. So they have to move intergenerationally, right? So they can only move if their children move, right? They can't move. Once they're there, they're there. So the only way a shift is gonna happen is if they can actually send out seeds far enough and the seeds can germinate and grow and survive, right? So it's gonna take a long time. And so this was a study and it was trying to see if trees are already moving. Like I said, we've already had about 30 years of warming so maybe trees are already shifting. So I don't know if you can see this, and I apologize if you can't, but the gray is the adult trees, and the red are the young trees, are the new trees. So they were seeing if we're already seeing new trees and younger trees moving north. Um, and the story was basically, for, so for example, the oaks are not moving. There's other additional issues with oak recruitment, which are certainly playing into this. Um, but something like sweet gum is actually starting to shift. We do actually see a lot of recruitment along the north. So something like sweet gum might move. Sugar maple, they ignored Canada. Um, so we're not entirely sure actually if sugar maple's moving, but the idea is that some species are moving and some are not. So some of them are gonna move, but some of them won't. So it's a species specific response, whether or not they are gonna migrate in response to climate change. The other issue too is it's only been 30 years. And we may just be starting to see some of this tree migration happen. And we're going to have to wait probably another 100 years or so, at least, to see if anything actually changes. Trees are slow. All right, so that's at the northern edge. And at the southern edge, things are getting warmer, right? So climate's also changing along the south. And we might expect some mortality. So maybe the trees in the south are going to die, right? Because climate is shifting. And this is that idea that we have current climate and everything is happy. There's some sort of mortality threshold that if it gets too warm and too dry, you know, we're hitting that drought and so we're going to see mortality, right? Under future climate, it's going to be warmer. I mean, that's pretty well established. So you can imagine this bubble just shifting up. And so we're going to see, or the expectation is we're going to see more tree mortality because it's going to be warmer. If it's warmer and drier, we're going to shift the bubble this way, and again, way more tree mortality. And this is already happening. So there's actually some pretty well-documented cases of what we call drought-induced wide-scale forest mortality. So it's happening all over the world. In all of these pictures, if you can see it, the gray are dead standing trees. 
and they can, they, it's been linked to drought. So extended drought periods have basically killed large pieces of forest. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so this is, the question was basically, in terms of causing this drought, is it something other than climate? Could it be potentially humans or? Right, so there's a, yeah. There, I mean, there is definitely something in terms of species composition shift that's human related. Um, and that is absolutely that we're basically doing, a, we, all of our forests are regrowing from being harvested. And so some of that species composition shift is the idea that we have basically shade intolerant species being replaced by more shade tolerant species. So that's definitely happening. In terms of the mortality, this is actually pretty well established that it is drought. They can take tree cores and they have good climate records and we can pretty much establish that these mortality events are drought related. But the species shift is, is certainly human. Humans are in there. Um, this is just to show, basically, it's happening all over the world. So every dot is a drought-related mor forest mortality event, and the colors just mean about when it happened. But pretty much all over the world, in all forested ecosystems, there's increases in drought and increased in mortality. So we have climate change causing potential extinctions and colonizations. So some species are shifting. We're losing some and gaining some. So we're going to shift our community composition, and the idea is that going to have an is that going to impact ecosystem functioning? Are we going to see a difference? So it's time to be a forest again, and this time it's more interesting, I promise, because everyone's different. Um, so look at your green card, okay? On your green card, there's different species. If you don't have it, you can always does everyone have a card? Anyways, so on your green card, you're a different species tells you something about the tree, and then it gives you some sort of ecosystem services that you provide, okay? So we're gonna do a little bit of like a thought experiment. Okay, so scenario one, black cherry, not necessarily here, but all over, black cherry is actually pretty vulnerable to climate change. So what happens if black cherry becomes locally extinct? So who here is black cherry? Hands up, we got in the back? Anyone else? Okay, so stand up if you can. Do, maybe we can borrow the mic or I guess I'll just repeat what you say. Do you want to stand up? So what do you provide to our ecosystem, to our forest? Okay, so we'll just do it one at a time. Okay, so black cherry is a really high quality timber species. People really like black cherry for timber. Hands up if you are a high quality timber species. Okay, so... We're probably okay in terms of that particular ecosystem function. We still have high quality timber in our forests. What else do you do? Carbon sequestration. Hands up if you do carbon sequestration. Right. So, I mean, pretty much all trees sequester carbon. So, I think we'll be okay. What else? Habitat for wildlife. Yep. Hands up if you provide habitat for wildlife. Okay, so we're okay. What else do you do? Yeah. Oh, sorry, say it again. Sorry, in the summer, right? Right. Produce in the summer. So there's, so there's something about food provisioning. So almost all tree species provide food. There are subtle differences in the type of food, but hands up if you provide food for wildlife. Okay, excellent. Now, not all of you are equal. How many of you provide food in the summer? Okay, so we still have some, but less, right? How many of you provide a nice berry, like cherry does? Or like a nice fruit? Like that's actually pretty, pretty high in sort of sugars and things. Okay, so we still have some that are providing berries that sort of that sort of style specifically for birds. So overall, how would my forest that I've created here do with losing black cherry? In terms of resistance, how resistant are we to losing black cherry? Has there any change? we're probably okay in terms of that overall change, right? So we're not actually gonna change a whole lot, right? 
Okay. Thank you very much. You can, you can be Black Cherry again in the next scenario. Oh, right. Sorry, I forgot. I'm sorry, I forgot. That's one more. Right, so nectar. And that's actually something unique. Who here produces nectar? Yeah. So most, there we go. So most of our forest tree species don't produce nectar because they're wind pollinated. So actually having flowers that produce nectar that are insect pollinated is a service that we might notice. Sorry, thank you for reminding me. Okay? All right. Sugar maple, oh no, sugar maple is also kind of experiencing a decline. Again, not necessarily here, but like sort of overall, sugar maple is experiencing a decline. So who here is sugar maple? All right, just two of you, wow. Okay, so we're so diverse, we have so many species. Okay, so what is one thing sugar maple does? Maple syrup. Mm. Hands up if you can provide maple syrup. <laughs> right? So this is an example of an ecosystem service that if we lost, we would care, right? Like, <laughs> Canada would fall apart. Um, no, we would definitely care if we lost maple syrup. And there's actually, I mean, the people who actually produce maple syrup are actually very concerned about climate change impacts on maple syrup production. This is a real issue, actually, it's not a joke. Um, and there is sort of concern for this. So this is something that we, we would have a hard time replacing, right? So what else does, um, Sugar maple do. Uh, fall yeah. So, and actually, I didn't put that on anyone else's. Um, and that was sort of. I find that you know other trees go nice colors too. But I actually this is this is talking about human values. I actually think red. I think sugar maple goes the most beautiful color in the fall, and no one else can rival that. So sorry. <laughs> no one else makes as beautiful colors as um, red as sugar maple. Okay, in the back because you're also sugar maple. What do you do? High quality timber, we already did this, right? So we do still have high quality timber in our forests. So I think everyone still produces habitat for wildlife. Right, so again, so sugar maples still make seeds that actually wildlife will eat. They're sort of more in the late summer, right? So they come at a slightly different time. Um, does anyone else have late summer? There are more species in the forest than the ones I've given out, but, okay? So if we lost sugar maple, we might start to care, right? In terms of resistance, in terms of like, you know, sugar maple, sorry, maple syrup production. If we lose sugar maple, it's going down. So resistance is down and resilience is zero. We wouldn't recover that until we recover sugar maple, right? All right. Scenario three, we generally ignore small understory trees in our climate simulations. This is in my research too. <laughs> in my research, and when we talk about climate change impacts in forests, we generally don't simulate or you don't even include what we call like those sort of small understory trees. So what are some of those unique ecosystem services that small understory trees offer? And so if you are a small understory tree, who's a small understory tree? It should say somewhere on the top. Okay, so what something, so what species are you? Spice bush, so what does spice bush do? Right, so it's actually the host plant for this caterpillar, the spice, the um, spice bush moth, sorry, silk moth, sorry. Someone else is a host, who else hosts that? Who's not spice bush? So sassafras, actually. So sassafras, both of those species actually are hosts for the same moth, but both of you are understory species. So if we lost you, we would lose that. So what else do you, what does sassafras do? Right, so sassafras, potentially not, not it's not a huge forest product, but in terms of cultural significance, right? So when we're talking about that, that fourth box, you know, which are human values and sort of, you know, cultural services. That's where that, you know, something like losing spice bush um, or sassafras, because that spice bush also is used for like sort of traditional cooking, right? So then we might actually, you know, so there would be that sort of ecosystem service that would be lost. Who else is a small understory tree? Who are you? Pawpaw, Paw, my favorite. I'm so excited. What do you do that we would not be able to replace?
Right, I mean, so the fact that it doesn't last is too un is as unfortunate, but it is. Papa is the only thing in our forest that makes a fruit that size. It's huge, right? And what else? Yes, it has carbon sequestration, but what would be unique if we lost Papa? No Papa Festival! <laughs> and again, this is one of those cultural values, right? So here in Southeast Ohio, we would all be really upset I imagine if we lost the Pawpaw Festival, right? And again, in terms of forest product, in terms of you know, biomass, it's a pretty small tree, it's pretty local, but there is a, you know, a pretty compelling service that it does provide. A whole festival is dedicated to this tree, right? And nothing else could replace it, right? We couldn't replace Pawpaw. Okay, any others? Small trees? Others, I can't remember how many I put out there. Yeah. Sassafras, papa, spice bush, I think maybe those are those three. Okay, so the moral of this story is that overall, when we talk about trying to increase forest resistance and resilience, it's about biodiversity, right? So you imagine the lodgepole pine scenario, right? Where everyone was the same species. Once it can no longer regenerate, we don't really know what's gonna happen. Right? There's, no, there's no resilience to that. It's gone and we're not entirely sure what's coming back. Right? So the best sort of you know, strategy going forward is to basically have really diverse forests. So I think there were 16 species is what I did. Um, and that's not even a fraction of what we have here in Southeast Ohio. So there are way more species out in the forest. And so that's one of the reasons why this part of the world is actually, I hate to say we're like, okay, for climate change, but we have so much diversity that potentially losing a species um, in terms of ecosystem functioning is gonna be okay. In terms of those unique ecosystem services, that's where we start to see potential problems, right? So white oak, who's white oak? White, so white oak is a species that is on, you know, there is a concern about white oak regeneration. Um, and so what are some of the things that white oak does that we would definitely notice? Whiskey barrels, um, and it's true. White oak is the only species used for whis making whiskey barrels, right? Yeah, what else? Right, so white oak is a fantastic food resource for wildlife, right? So they produce really, like a large amount of acorns, they're highly nutritious, um, but who else produces acorns? Hands up. Red oak, who else do we have out here? Chestnut oak, who else? Black oak. And I only put four oaks in because I was getting tired. Um, but we actually have many more species of oaks. So it is a good point. I mean, they do produce a really high quality food resource for wildlife, but we do have lots of species of oaks uh, that would be able to also basically produce those acorns. Right? Okay, and I think that's all I had. But I'm happy to take questions um, about anything. Yep. Oh, this has nothing to do with climate change. <laughs> and it's true. Um, okay, what, what are my thoughts about the proposed fire in Wayne National Forest? Um, so here is, this has nothing to do with climate change. This is my opinion. So take it as you will. So in this part of the world, fire is not, we don't have fire adapted species the way that we have fire adapted species at West, right? So even our pines, we don't have serotonous cones. Things like oak have thicker bark and deep tap roots, so they're kind of fire resistant, so they can certainly tolerate a fire. So, but whether or not we're supposed to be setting fires quite so frequently, you know, they're not exactly like waiting for fire. However, oak does like open light conditions, right? So if, it's, so if you look at fire as a management tool and not as we're trying to recreate a natural fire regime, I think those are different. So if we think of oak fire as like, this is my management tool to increase oak regeneration, that's fine. The other management tool we have is harvesting. We can go out and basically cut some of the overstory, right? So you can, the idea is to try to, you know, increase light availability, kill back some of the species that are coming up that we don't want, and fire does that. So there's my answer, yep. Wow. <laughs> Okay, if the CEO of Amazon pledged $10 billion to climate change, 
what would I do with climate change? What would I do with the $10 billion or million or whatever? Some lot, lots of money. Um, so I, this is me. There's a lot of um, discussion right now about planting trees. Um, and I do think that that's viable in certain parts of the world. So I do, what, it, what I would do with all this money is I would do a combination of buying land and protecting it. So just basically protecting what we already have. It's, already, it's way better to protect what you have than try to recreate it. So I would spend my money on protecting forests um, or ecosystems in general. I can be more than forests, I guess. Uh, but I would, I would spend my money on basically protecting land that already exists and then whatever's left, restoring and doing basic restoration in places um, to basically plant trees or if it's supposed to be a forest or grassland. Yeah. Absolutely. So the question was, living in Athens, Ohio, what can we do to slow down climate change or make a difference? Right. And I thought about this after. I usually end my climate change talks with like something uplifting because I find sometimes climate change can be a bit of a downer. Like, oh no, the world is burning. Um, and so I do usually actually, and I didn't. So this is a really good question. There's a lot you can actually do. So, I, so are you a student? Yeah. So you as a student, as an undergraduate or a graduate student, are living your most sustainable life. You have the smallest carbon footprint you will ever have in your life right now. And it's because you live, you, you live in shared housing usually, you don't have a car, you don't travel so much because you can't afford it. A lot of you are vegetarian, partially because meat is expensive and partially because there's this movement to become vegetarian. So you are already making a lot of carbon neutral or you know, carbon positive choices as a student, partially by choice and partially by you know, circumstance. But so the best thing I tell people is think about this moment as you go forward, right? And so even though you start earning more money, you don't need to buy an enormous house. You don't need to get five cars. You know, you can continue, if you can maintain this lifestyle going forward, right? You actually will make a difference. The other thing I always tell people is vote. You can always make a difference in the political sphere, and so vote is also another great way to make a difference for climate change at a, at a different level. Sure. That's a, yeah. So as a private, you know, private landowners, if you own a forest, would like, what could you do? Um, in terms of managing your forest for climate change? Right, is that summarized? Um, right, so like I said, the best thing you can do is maintain diversity in your woodlot. And so this is partially going out and checking and seeing who's coming in, right? So are you getting sort of new species coming up? Are you getting the same species? Is it all red maple underneath? Um, and so basically anything you can do to increase diversity. So this would be like single tree harvesting is a good thing. Maintaining big trees as seed sources so don't go in and just take the biggest trees because those are your best seed producers. So you want to maintain them too. Um, and just kind of make a diverse forest. Yep. I don't know that much about urban forest management, honestly, but I think there's a real potential for it to be very important. Um, cities make lots of choices about which trees to plant, how many trees to plant, um, and especially in terms of um, cooling, um, basically having urban forests, like having er trees inside urban landscapes make a big difference for keeping cities cooler. So. Yeah, so the question is, under climate change, which are the species that are maybe going to be the most resilient or, or basically not as affected? So the good news for oak is, in general, almost all the oaks are, are projected to be um, better adapted to climate change. They actually can tolerate dry conditions. So this warming and drying across the board, oaks are probably going to do fine. The ones that are sort of on the cusp are the ones that either have um, pest outbreaks, so things like hemlock and the woolly adelgid or ash, so these sort of connections with disturbances are really problematic, or ones that really need it to be quite wet. I'm just going to look on this side because I haven't, I'm ignoring, yep. Yeah. 
That's a good question. So with temperatures rising, are rainforests going to expand? So honestly, there's very little done about range expansion in rainforests, partially because the degree of climate variation is so small. Their borders aren't really determined by climate unless you're talking elevation. But if you're talking like we are here, where we talk about latitude, um, it's not quite the same. Um, so their biggest shifts aren't necessarily going to be temperature, but are more going to be precipitation. So there are shifts in precipitation, um, potentially getting drier, and that's where you might see shifts. But Yeah, so the question is about, it's not just about like warmer extremes, like those days over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, but what about like those cold extremes? Um, and so I haven't, so overall, like when we look at minimum winter temperatures, they're just going up. We're not seeing like really random, like really cold winters. But what we are seeing is a lot of variation in spring. And so times of the year where we wouldn't actually be cold, we can have these really, you know, all of a sudden it's like this really late spring frost that's sort of unexpected. Um, and those have a huge impact on trees because a lot of trees will actually start setting their buds and flowers, start producing flowers, you know, in March, like really early. And so if we get like a, a, a random freeze, it basically kills all of those flowers um, and can damage the, the buds as well. And so you would see an impact basically that year on seed production. And if, we, if that happens more frequently, then again, we might see sort of longer term effects as well. So, um, we don't have any that I would say are endangered. Um, the most sensitive species is red spruce, probably, which we don't really have here. That's, um, yeah, in terms of climate change impacts for the US. Lots of caveats, but, yep. So the question is, how are extreme weather events impacting tree immune systems or like response to pests? Um, I'm not sure about like the, the variation, but I have heard, I have read, um, or what I do know about is the, the impact of drought on their ability to withstand pests. So one of the other reason with the bark beetles, why they're increasing and having outbreaks is because the tree, it is a natural, you know, it's a natural native bark beetle. And what usually happens is healthy trees, the bark beetle starts chewing, and healthy trees start producing pitch, and they basically push the insect out, right? And so you can actually see um, pine trees that are full of these little pitch holes, and these are all ejected um, beetles. When they're drought stressed, they can't do that. And so this is, again, one of those, it's, it's a, there's so many like feedback effects, but again, it's sort of one of those things, because they're stressed from climate and drought, they're not able to actually defend and sort of push the beetles out that the way that they should be able to. And there's also more of them with higher survival. Yeah, in the back. Right, so the question is about what are, what's precipitation impacts with climate change and are we gonna get wetter as well? So, the interesting thing is when you look at climate change projections, everyone agrees on warmer. Precipitation, it depends on where you are. Some parts of the world are getting drier and some parts are getting wetter. Here in Southeast Ohio, we are gonna get wetter. So, and it's true, also this idea of if it is warmer, warm air holds more water, right? And so there is a potential for um, sort of increased precipitation. And, but, and so it is true in some parts of the world, basically sort of a yes and no. Some parts are definitely getting drier and some parts are getting wetter. There are, yep, there are some species that we say they hate to get their feet wet, right? And so there are some species that don't like these waterlogged conditions. And so for those particular species, yeah, they're not going to be that happy with wetter conditions. 
So yeah, it can be both positive and negative depending on the species. Yep. And that so and thank you. So in this part of the world, we are getting a more we are more precipitation, but it's falling in the winter, and the fall. And so basically, the but we so it's a weird dichotomy that we're going to have more precipitation and more summer drought, because we're getting more precipitation, but it's not falling in the summer. It's more likely to fall over the winter. So it's not as it's not as simple as just like more precipitation. It's also about when the precipitation happens, which is going to be important. Absolutely. I mean, so the invasive species issue is something that I think is a constant battle. Um, and it always feels like there's always a new invasive species. But you're talking about invasive plants as well, like honeysuckle is an invasive plant. Absolutely. I mean, so you can absolutely volunteer to basically pull honeysuckle, to pull garlic mustard. And it, we do. We want to, because in the places, there's certain places where they have been pretty successful at removing some of these invasive shrubs. And they fairly quickly see the natives come back, right? And so you can absolutely make a difference you know, pulling out some of these native shrubs. And they do, they take over and they sort of reduce our native plant diversity. So, yeah. Ah, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> My research, no kidding. <laughs> um, what's understudied? Yeah, so what I do, so we always think what we do is, is super critical, but, um, <laughs> so I'm going to go for it. Um, but what I study, most of my research is actually focused on seeds and recruitment. So those very early life stages. And a lot of climate change research has focused on mortality and growth. Um, and I do think we're kind of not focusing enough on those early life stages because I think we make a lot of assumptions that, well, clearly the seeds will get there and then there'll be no problem for seeds to germinate and to grow and to turn into a reproducing adult. Um, so we make a lot of assumptions along the way and most of the data is about climate and growth or climate and mortality. And there's a lot less about climate and reproduction or climate and recruitment. Sorry, can you repeat it? About seeds and... Oh, seed banks and seed saving. Yeah, so seed banks and seed saving are usually focused on agricultural crops because it's about saving genetic diversity. And when we have agricultural crops and highly cultivated crops, we sort of over time reduce and lose diversity. We don't actually have that much of a problem, at least with forest species, because we don't cultivate them the same way that we would cultivate agriculture crops. Yep. Hmm. So the question is, are invasive plants more climate adaptable than maybe the native plants? Um, Potentially, I haven't actually seen anything to say that. I know just from experience, some of the trees, like some like honeysuckle and things like that, they they keep their leaves longer, so they kind of are able to like they have some sort of different climate signals. But I haven't seen anything that they just have wider climate tolerances. But maybe I don't know that much about it. The question was about like basically pulp and paper companies will cut down the forest and then they have to replant, but are they going so fast that they can't, like it's not, like they're cutting them down too fast? Well, or? Still oh, in terms of carbon sequestration. Yeah, so I mean, and I actually don't know much about the pulp and paper industry here in the US, 
I know more about it in Canada, where we have a huge pulp and paper industry. So, yeah. So, and they do. I mean, they do absolutely cut them down. They are mandated to replant. Um, in terms of offsetting carbon, there's sort of two schools of thought. It used to be thought that the youngest trees actually took up more carbon. Like they were better carbon sequesters than old trees because they're growing so fast and they're taking more carbon. Um, but about a year or two ago, there were some really cool studies that came out that said, no, no, big old trees take in just as much carbon and it's not an age-related thing at all. So I don't think we can use the argument that small trees are somehow taking up more carbon. But I don't mind the pulp and paper provided they are on this cycle that they plant. Six years later, they come and harvest. And then, like, as, as long as they manage their land fine, I don't, I mean, I think it can be a sustainable, renewable resource. But in terms of carbon, I don't see the advantage. So the question is, is climate change causing us to lose more of our riparian zones? And again, that's going to depend on where in the world you are. So um, if you are basically a place that's getting drier and drier and you're losing your river, then theoretically your riparian zone might change. But that's going to take years and years and years. I mean, that's, that's on the scale of maybe in a hundred years, you know, a long time before we'd notice that. The alternative is places that are going to flood more frequently, we'd actually see potentially an expansion because the trees that grow in those riparian zones are the ones that tolerate being wet just fine, right? And it's the other trees that would suffer. But I haven't actually seen much about climate change impacts on riparian sort of areas in general. So I don't know. But one more question. Sure, go ahead. They basically, they all absorb carbon. It's not really, I don't think we can po point to one species and say this one takes up more carbon than they all, they all basically absorb carbon. Yeah, I don't think there's a special species. Well, thank you, and give thanks to Rebecca. And the line is, all trees are good. All right, we want, we want, all, all trees are good.